Thank you very much, Gwen. It's good to be here. And to Frank and uh, to Judy and uh, to my good friend, Gonzalo, good to see you and colleagues. Um, can I, just before I start, uh, uh, recognise Frank and the service that he's done. This is his last year in office and, uh, um, and his last conference in, in the capacity. So uh, uh, Frank has been a great advocate for you all and uh, we've always had a constructive relationship uh, with our office, uh, with myself personally, and I thank him for his professional and his polite approach to, uh, to the job. So but I can assure you that uh, uh, he's a fierce advocate uh, for, for public education, for secondary schools in particular. Um, can I start off by thanking you all uh, for the great work and leadership you do in our schools and our government schools. Uh, you, as uh, Frank said, you know, leadership is just so important. Uh, you're, you're front and centre. Um, you have the unenviable task of uh, bringing those many groups together, uh, working together, to ensure that uh, your school uh, is doing the right thing and meeting the needs uh, of the students in your care because after all, uh, the education of those students is the most important thing uh, that you do in your schools and obviously that is the reason for their existence. Um, you know, I recognise it's an incredibly challenging environment, uh, whether it's the knowns or the unknowns, uh, it, it's a, uh, always a dynamic uh, environment in which you are working and one of which uh, tests you personally and professionally at many opportunities, uh, almost daily. And, uh, and there's probably no more stark example over the weekend of, um, uh, up in uh, Kareem where there's a, uh, uh, been a, um, a shooting uh, and uh, some almost unbearable violence that many young students, uh, young people in our schools, uh, have been witness to. And uh, so, that will involve a few schools, um, the trauma, the immediate trauma, the ongoing trauma uh, for those school communities where everybody knows each other uh, it is quite incredible. And uh, the principals, of course, of those schools and teachers uh, will be at the forefront in meeting um, those, those first reactions uh, and working with those students and families, and often families, not just the students, because that's the leadership role the school often plays in the community. And, uh, and it's just an uh, incredible example of, um, of the reality of the life of the principal and the importance of the school within a community. In terms of uh, uh, the way forward and where we've come from, the policy documents towards Victoria's learning community and new directions and the, uh, and the actions paper resulting from that are really are the key to uh, where uh, I see education where I see the future of education. And we unashamedly, those, those um, uh, documents are about the importance of the students in our care <coughs> and about student learning and they're about taking Victoria, uh, our system, up to one of the top tier uh, systems in the world. We certainly have top tier and uh, some of the best classrooms and teaching in the world in individual schools. We have individual schools that are uh, uh, top tier and uh, um, so many of you are visited by um, colleagues from around the country and from around the world because you are doing world class things in your schools and in your classrooms. And it's so important that we owe it to our children that we take the whole system, we do this at scale and that uh, every school and every classroom uh, gets to that top tier. And that unashamedly is my, um, my goal. That's what I think we owe, as I know, we owe our students, uh, and uh, we really do uh, need to work together to ensure that what we do in our various roles and responsibilities take our whole system uh, to that top tier. Um, I just want to mention a, uh, and no, no particular order of importance, but just to particular, uh, cover a, a range of um, uh, issues that I think are out there. Um, and, uh, and give an indication of where uh, I see them going and, uh, and where I would like to see them going. First of all, uh, the money is one of those things that uh, is, is part of your everyday uh, environment and certainly mine. Uh, and it's, I just wanted to re-emphasise the fact that um, uh, since uh, two th our first budget in 2011-12, the education budget, that means that the actual component that goes to schools has actually increased by, by $1 billion, in fact $400 million just in the last budget. So as the state's finances get back on track, 
uh, we're now able to put uh, more money into the sort of services that make a real difference that obviously our schools are. So that extra $400 million uh, in this year's budget is an indication of where we are as, as a state, where we can now afford to put that sort of uh, uh, extra resources into our schools. One of the very uh, basic and uh, probably the most least sexy thing that happens in schools, and which is a massive responsibility of you, is just the general maintenance of your school. And uh, uh, that is one of the things I think is, uh, is so often just the, the public face of schools, unfortunately, where, uh, where judgments are made just on the, on the look of the school when parents drive past the school and their impressions when they come in the front door. Um, and uh, sometimes they don't get past that and don't understand the great things that are happening in the school. And um, as you know, we've carried out that uh, um, the, we've had the audit, uh, the maintenance audit. Uh, but, and because of that, we've realised that the, you know, the breadth of the problem, the depth of the problem, um, and that's why we've increased our, the maintenance funding because not just in, in terms of the SRP, but in one-off funding because we really do feel that uh, that is one of the, uh, just the hard things that need to be done by schools and need to be done by government and we'll continue to support you in that very, very basic uh, of, uh, of issues. Uh, in terms of capital works, once again, as the budget uh, has come back into a better situation, uh, we've seen this year uh, an expenditure of $500 million on capital works. Uh, $191 million of that is uh, for our public-private partnership schools. And I know some of you are, are principals of uh, schools, the PPP schools, and you speak very highly of them because there's basically no maintenance involved, and uh, which is, uh, uh, and allows you to freeze you up to do this, the educational leadership and. Uh, uh, and not have to worry about uh, some of those side issues. So we have um, uh, an extra 11 schools that we built uh, in growth areas uh, on land that we've already purchased over the last few years. But there are massive pressures on, on uh, capital works. It's not just in the growth areas, the outer suburbs. Uh, there are a whole range of regenerations that need that have started and need to continue. Uh, we have uh, huge growth pressures in our inner suburbs, you know, for example, in uh, Coburg, uh, in South Melbourne, where we're putting money into more government uh, school education, and uh, in the future we're uh, working in the Paran area as well. And of course, there's uh, uh, a number of schools, probably about 200 schools, that were at various stages of planning. Uh, some were even ready, had their tender documentation ready, and were expecting the funding. So there are massive pressures all around, and I certainly recognise that on uh, uh, just not only the new areas, but uh, making your school. Uh, suitable uh, for 21st century learning. Um, in terms of ongoing funding, uh, this, uh, this almost this time last year, we uh, signed the Better Schools funding with the uh, agreement with the federal government, and that was $12 billion over six years. Uh, the Victorian government's commitment was $5.4 billion over six years of that, uh, of that 12.2. Um, and uh, some wanted me to sign up to that agreement immediately and, uh, and I wasn't prepared to do that because there was this massive impost on control of schools uh, by Canberra, no matter who was in government in Canberra. Uh, the ramifications were, uh, I don't think, the right thing at all for Victoria or any school in Victoria because we have such a decentralised and autonomous system and to be further controlled by Canberra, uh, this was not uh, on my agenda at all. And also, um, uh, as well as the control aspect, the, what the initial uh, uh, funding agreement had um, would have seen about 500 Victorian schools, mainly government schools, actually go backwards in their funding. So I wasn't prepared to sign up to that. So I think in the end, after a lot of uh, um, discussion uh, and recognition, we ended up with an agreement that uh, I, I think it was the best possible agreement for the Victorian schools going forward. Um, we have with the change of government in, in uh, Canberra, the disappointment of the years five and six federal component of funding, where most of the funding was, uh, it is, um, uh, it is off the table as it was to be in, in, uh, according to the agreement that we signed. Um, and uh, I will continue to fight for that. Um, this is the third federal government I've had to fight for Victoria's interests uh, for, and I will continue to do that. Um, one good thing though is that uh, current federal government said that uh, they're not interested and running our schools, I'll leave that up to the states. So I'll certainly take that and uh, run with that, as you will too. Uh, 
but uh, in terms of those extra two years of funding, uh, they are uh, two years of uh, funding that uh, we need, uh, that I recognise we actually signed up to, we didn't sign up to an agreement with the political party, it was between the state of Victoria and the federal government, and I'll continue to fight for those. So this year's um, state budget was really the first uh, budget of six, of six budgets uh, where the uh, bit of funding actually flowed through. And uh, so within that budget, we saw, the, uh, as I said earlier, an extra $400 million uh, going to the intergovernment in winter schools in Victoria, and $170 million of that $400 uh, is for low, low socioeconomic uh, uh, schools to pick up the students who uh, uh, come from those areas that uh, require that extra assistance. So the, what you will see um, uh, over the next four years uh, is the ramping up of that funding agreement, and hopefully in years five and six uh, we'll come to an agreement with the federal government. But I can assure you that uh, our $5.4 billion commitment over six years uh, will remain that way. The most important thing about education, the reason I got into politics in the first place was students and student learning, because my background is education. And, uh, and, and that's where I wanted to make a difference. And if we're to be, do the best possible things for our students to take our system up to the top, one of the top tiers in the world, we have to, the top tier in the world, uh, we, it's all about student learning. And student learning is underpinned by, by the curriculum, by the pedagogy, by the system, by reporting. They're the four pillars. Uh, in terms of curriculum, uh, it is, and uh, Frank alluded to this, about the, the freeing up of um, and allowing you to specialise, um, to deliver, to organise, to integrate the curriculum in the way that best suits your school, the students in your school, the experience and expertise of your teachers and the needs of your community. And that is just so important. And that's an absolute tenet as far as I'm, I'm concerned. There are a lot of side issues and side shows running and there's always a review of the federal, federal governments of uh, curriculums and, Bit of tinkering around the edge and a bit of political uh, posturing about uh, uh, national curriculum. As far as I'm concerned, that is a sideshow. The most important thing is that uh, there are basic requirements and the curriculum, curriculum exemplar uh, sets that out. But apart from that, uh, as I said, how you deliver the curriculum, how it's organised, how you specialise it, how you integrate it is a decision that needs to be made at your school level. And it's up to you. Know, you have to make that decision. You have to talk about that. And you are accountable for that. It's not a free for all. You have to say why you're doing what you're doing, uh, and, uh, and that is very, very important. But uh, the national curriculum and uh, uh, Osdals is not incredibly prescriptive. I don't want it to be, and I trust your professional capacity to do the right thing as far as the curriculum is concerned in your school. And we've seen some innovations in terms of, for example, the. Uh, uh, opening up the uh, senior uh, senior certificates with uh, the Victorian Baccalaureate, um, with the um, uh, industry pathways, uh, with um, our, uh, some of the university uh, qualifications or the, uh, subjects being credited as part of the students' ATAR. So we have to look at right through the school, right through um, the curriculum, at uh, uh, pathways and qualifications and subjects and skills that will actually uh, be relevant to the students in our schools. In terms of pedagogy, we really do, I think there's a greater understanding now that all our students learn in different ways. I think as educators, we always have known that. But often what we actually do in our schools and the pedagogy that happens in our schools does not really reflect that understanding. And uh, we have pedagogy and then we have to slot the children into to our pedagogy, whereas it should be the other way around. We need to understand how the children in our schools learn and we need to adapt our pedagogy to suit uh, how our students learn. And um, we need to be able to articulate that and we want our students to. One of the things I've seen uh, so well uh, in our schools is that uh, uh, when I talk to students, so many of them have obviously had this conversation with their teachers and in their schools where they are able to articulate about how they learn, the sort of learning that makes a difference for them. And, uh, uh, and because they are able to do that, it's quite obvious that the schools uh, they go to are actually uh, meeting that need uh, and are very, very alive to that. And, uh, and that's where the best learning is actually taking place. And again, it's not a free for all and, uh, and every school needs to uh, have a, uh, an understanding and be able to articulate uh, and tell and talk about 
and uh, demand um, a certain pedagogical approach, uh, and you are accountable for that. But I'm not going to tell you what that approach is because you know what is going to work for the students. You know what your staff like, where they are in their learning journey, and how far you have to take them. In terms of assessment, we now have the assessment portal running up, uh, running, and so that is a one-stop shop for where you can go to um, find a range of quality uh, uh, assured assessment uh, tools, um, and uh, that, that will only grow as schools and uh, other organisations partner add assessment tools to that portal. So it's that one-stop shop so that we're actually getting to real-time assessment. I mean, assessment in its truest uh, form has got to be something that's useful. It's not a tick-the-box exercise, so you can show a whole lot of tests and assessments that have been done. Its assessment is there to actually inform the teaching that you actually do on a day-to-day -day basis and a week-to-week -week basis for what happens in your school. So that uh, having an assessment tool that is readily available, that is relevant, um, and is going to inform teaching uh, is the most important and only assistance uh, tools that we really want in our schools. So once again, it's up to a school. You have to have assessment, you have to do it, but what you choose to do and how you um, uh, implement that within your school uh, 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 curriculum and uh, everyday programs it is up to you. But it is a very, very important part of your school. And it also plays in as a very important part, obviously, uh, of the profession, uh, performance and development uh, uh, framework as well, because uh, uh, assessment and student outcomes are certainly a very, very important part of that. And finally, in terms of reporting, um, it is just so important that as principals you need feedback, uh, parents want to know how their students are going, students want to know how they're going, uh, teachers want to know how they're going. So no, no matter where you are on the feedback cycle, everybody likes feedback. I get lots of feedback um, uh, without even looking for it often. Uh, and, but uh, whether good or bad, it's always good to get the feedback. And, and uh, uh, if I want to mark out of 10, but what I want is um, an assessment to report back to me of how I'm going um, and, uh, and what I can do about where I am. And uh, so I think uh, in a very practical level, and one which I think is very important for, for our school communities is that we have plain English uh, reporting uh, that actually makes sense to parents, but is also useful to, to, uh, to teachers. And getting that balance right, I think is very, very important. So once again, uh, there's no one size fits all here. How you uh, report back to your uh, parent community, school community and your students is up to you. You've got to have something that's got to be evidence space, uh, but uh, what it actually might look like is, is up to you. Um, just moving on to the performance development framework. Again, uh, I know there were certainly timing issues uh, as far as that was concerned this year, and certainly one of, one of the pressures that's uh, uh, been on you as the school leaders in terms of not only your um, performance development, but uh, uh, especially the, all the staff that you interact with uh, and your leadership team interact with uh, on a, uh, with, with your staff. Um, I really uh, think that the model that we've got and the work that has been put into that, the research uh, uh, has gone into it and uh, the best practice that it's actually based on uh, and the flexibility that's within it I think recognises uh, probably the first uh, real um, assessment uh, tool or performance tool uh, that you have, uh, that we've had in our schools uh, for a long, long time, and probably uh, I can't remember one, uh, that is, uh, I think, can make the biggest difference. You know, when you look at it, when you look at what you have to assess, what you have to talk uh, and negotiate with your teachers about, what you have to hold them accountable for, uh, the proof uh, and the, uh, that they need to provide, the evidence they need to provide, um, I think is a great basis on those very, very important professional conversations that you've got to have uh, with all your teachers. And it's not just that, the importance of that number one, but it's the importance of the fact that teachers then have to think uh, in different terms often about, uh, some schools have been doing this incredibly well, and teachers as a matter of course. But we want this, as I said, it's no good having it in a couple of good schools. We need to have it at, across the system. We need to be doing it at scale. And uh, to me, this is a real accountability and, uh, and I think uh, uh, a great opportunity and I think uh, one that I think will have far-reaching, very positive uh, consequences 
for the quality of our teachers and our teaching in our schools, but also not only with your own uh, profession, uh, your own performance and development, uh, but you'll learn uh, much about your staff and, uh, and, and it will give you the opportunity to reflect about your understanding of your school community, of each individual teacher uh, within your school and what their needs are. So I think it's a very, very powerful tool and one I think is just scratching the surface of what we really need to uh, uh, keep track on and, uh, and give you the best possible support so that uh, uh, that remains as important as it should be. Um, language is an inter internationalisation of education. The students in our schools and will be working, they'll be living, they'll be studying and they'll be travelling more than any other generation. So they need the language and cultural skills to be able to work and live and study in that world. Um, their uh, peers in other countries will be coming to this country and will be working and studying, competing for jobs and, uh, uh, and being part of our community. And many of them will have the, the, the sorts of skills that are so important for that global world. We cannot escape that. That is the reality. That is the world in which our students will be going into. So it's so important that uh, our, our students have the language and cultural skills to be able to uh, participate in that world uh, and to make a real difference, not only for themselves, but obviously for, for the state and, and the country's economy. And in so many ways that is happening in our schools and it's just so, I see so many uh, teachers and principals talking about the importance of immersion programs, of school relationships, of languages, education, of cultural, uh, uh, understanding and it has been done on multiple levels uh, right across the system and just in the last year we've seen a nine percent increase in you know, schools that are offering a, um, a, a language other than English as part of their education you know, program and that is wonderful to see. So we will continue to resource that, uh, we'll continue to encourage that and uh, we just think it's so important that uh, our students have the opportunity uh, to have that, those learning, those um, learning the opportunities, the, the, uh, the curriculum, uh, and also the skills uh, that they'll be exposed to in their everyday school life. Um, in terms of uh, the environment, the safe environment and uh, supportive environment that uh, is just one of those most important preconditions to learning in, in any school, um, it's that mix of being proactive and reactive of giving you principals and school leaders the, the powers and the authority uh, to make those sorts of decisions that you need to make uh, for the safety and the good of all in your school, of all students and of all your staff in the broader school community. And uh, so whether it's the suspension and expulsion guidelines, uh, whether it's extra powers that you've been given, uh, they are very, very important, uh, in a way reactive, but re realistic um, uh, powers and supports that you need. I mean, obviously, we've got to have the proactive work, whether it's it's, a, it's work with the bully stoppers, it's e-smart, it's the professional development for challenging behaviours, a whole range of upskilling that's required uh, for you and for your staff uh, and for the students that, about the problems, the initial problems that uh, cause so many of the issues at school. Um, yes, we've got to do that, and we've got a lot of work on that, and we will continue to do that. But at the same time, the everyday reality is that uh, Monday morning, some parents going to come into your office, and some students going to run, run up on a Tuesday, uh, and you've got to think on straight away of the safety of that student or that parent, but most importantly of the broader school community, and make the sorts of decisions and be feel supported in those decisions, and have the tools to uh, uh, to be able to react to those decisions for the safety and the good of all. That is something that uh, I'll never shy away from about getting that balance right, about the proactive work but also giving you the power and the support uh, for what you have to do in the heat of the moment uh, in your school on a day, or sometimes, unfortunately, on a daily basis. Finally, the last thing I want to talk about is, uh, um, is this idea of uh, um, what the role of the department is in supporting the, what you do. Now, I know that there's been a massive cultural shift, and cultural shift takes a long while. You've come into a school and wanted to move a culture, you know what it's like. Um, the cultural shift required of um, moving uh, a department from the management style uh, to a support uh, is a massive change. 
Uh, a lot of people within the department get it, um, a lot don't. And, uh, um, and unfortunately, all the meat in the sandwich, as far as that's concerned, I think. But I think, in, in speaking quite bluntly to you as colleagues, I think there are a number of principals, I think, and school leaders and teachers have relied very, very heavily on the department um, uh, to tell them what to do and when to do it. And, uh, uh, and for a range of reasons, I think uh, many have been afraid to act without getting the permission of the regional office or the department uh, before they actually you know, go in a certain direction, no matter what it might be, whether it be curriculum or organisation or staffing. Um, so that is, that is part of the culture. And um, I just am convinced that the support, sort of support that you need is from people who understand what you're doing on a day-to-day -day basis. So you need the support from each other, uh, but you need the resources so that you can support each other, uh, and you need to be freed up to, to enable you to do that, whether it's you or it's um, um, practising colleagues or former uh, colleagues. It is so important that we have a system where teachers go to each other for help, um, anyone within the staff, they go to you for help, you go to your peers to support, um, and that uh, everyone realises that um, um, that all um, wisdom does not reside uh, in my office or in the department, and it's so important that uh, uh, we give you the tools not to build up the department so it uh, can help you more, we want to build up the skills and the support so that you can help each other so much more. And obviously there are things that only departments can do, and yes, we should be doing those and we should be doing them better, but it's so important that uh, the everyday uh, sort of supports that you need is the practical, yes, that the department do, but I think the educational and professional and personal supports are far better coming from, uh, from each of you uh, and each other. And uh, that is, is a massive change. And, uh, and I know, as I said, and I recognise that you are caught up uh, um, in that cultural change where you are. And, and many of you say to me that various people, various divisions within your region or essentially have been fantastic supports to you in, in, in a whole range of issues and it's pleasing to hear that. Uh, but um, there are lots of you are saying uh, other things about other sections of the department that uh, I think um, that message really needs to be, to be out there. And I noticed there's an no, article in the age today uh, about uh, uh, the, the lack of, um, in the senior leadership of the department, uh, the lack of uh, uh, school experience of many of, um, uh, of, of those who are making decisions uh, about education. And, uh, and, and to me, I think that is an important point. I think it's very important that uh, those, we, we, those who are um, intimately part of your life um, should, uh, if they haven't been to teachers or principals, should be out in our schools a lot uh, and, and uh, being um, and just understanding the everyday reality of the school. And that's why, um, just for example, in my office it's fine because I was a principal for 15 years, uh, but I still obviously have to stay in touch with schools. My wife's a teacher, she understands the realities and always puts out the classroom reality to me on a daily basis when I go home for. Uh, uh, bright ideas, but even within my own staff, <coughs> I uh, make sure that uh, my advisors uh, come out with me. For example, my chief of staff is here with me today. It's just so important that all my staff get out there and understand the realities of, of, uh, of schools. I mean, we get a lot of phone calls from teachers and principals and schools about various issues, but nothing actually beats getting out there into the school to see what it looks like. So I think it's important that uh, you know, the leadership um, and uh, the, of the department, if they are not to manage you, but to support you, need to understand. You can't support somebody if you don't understand what they're actually going through. And again, I think that, uh, that work is just beginning and, uh, and I want more, I will be putting more support and more emphasis on that support for you so that you can support each other and therefore make the biggest difference in your school. I might leave it at that because my voice is failing and I've got a long cabinet meeting ahead of me. But uh, thank you for giving me the, the honour of uh, opening your conference today. Um, you've got a great program planned, so please make the most of it. But as we all know, the best work at a conference happens at morning tea at lunchtime and probably tonight's dinner. So make sure you engage in, uh, in those aspects with all due respect to your men and the other presenters. Uh, but I'm sure uh, um, uh, you'll be able to.
to make a, uh, the, the absolute most professionally and personally of, of this conference. And I just had a thought there, Frank. Um, you might be looking for something to do next year. You, you know what the reality of the classroom the schools are, so uh, we may have a role for you within the department next year as well. So uh, I'll be biting off more than I can chew there, but anyway. Um, okay. uh, once again, thank you so much for what you're doing for students in your care, and please enjoy the conference. Uh, I hope you get so much out of it. It gives me great pleasure to officially open the 2014 VAST conference. Thank you.